just caught up with my buddy Sean um, and Adrian, obviously, XY advisor. Uh, these guys over the last couple of years have um, changed their business direction a few times, but have ended up in a in a position where they're trying to uh, make efficient that piece between, uh, you know, when you meet the advisor, sorry, you meet the client and then uh, you hand on to the power plan and that sort of really annoying in between part. Um, we cover a few different things, you know, we, we get into some, uh, you know, jovial positions, certainly around, uh, Adrian Patty, which is always, you know, a huge, uh, uh, highlight of my life is any, ch- any chance I get to make fun of him. But, um, but yeah, like it's, it's a great podcast to hear about some, some views on the future of advice and uh, yeah hopefully you enjoy this episode is proudly sponsored by NetWealth. Launching nearly 20 years ago, this ASX-listed company is ranked number one for overall platform functionality and user satisfaction by investment trends for the past three years. As the financial advice landscape changes, it's important now more than ever to embrace new technology and enhance the way you do business. With this change comes your chance to innovate, explore new perspectives, and realize new efficiencies. NetWealth is here to support you on this journey by providing you market-leading technology, excellent customer support, and expertise to help you innovate in your business. Visit the NetWealth website to learn more and get the PDS which clients should read before making a decision. Products issued by NetWealth Investments Limited. G'day, g'day. How's it going? What do you know? Strike a light. Oh, how do you not get annoyed by that when he does <laughs> Sure, no. What's happening, man? Uh, not much. Good afternoon. Thanks yeah. for having me along. No, nah, look, it's a pleasure. Um, it's kind of interesting having you and Adrian here at the same time, considering you guys are uh, business owners. But right here, right now, it's me and Patty versus you, good sir. This is XY time right now. Yeah, well, totally. I was kind of hoping he wouldn't be here so we could throw the booty <laughs> in. But, um, no, no, we're going to bo- kick the booty you into have. you. Uh, <laughs> it's all on. It's all on. Um, just, just very briefly, met Sean at uh, Dixon Advisory. Uh, he was there for one day. Well, we were in the office for one day together. Uh, he doesn't remember meeting me. I remember meeting him. Uh, that's how we pretty met. standard. Yeah, occurrence the class. <laughs> pretty, pretty standard. How did you? How did you guys meet? Just through through, through you guys. Yeah, through XY. Yeah, yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. And uh, in a lot of ways, Shona, you've been sort of uh, a, an honorary member for a long time of XY, sort of helping us, you know, take take uh, chances and and help us with some key decisions over the years. And then mm. um, you've obviously teamed up with this uh, this attention to detail connoisseur over here, amongst other things. Amongst uh, other things. <laughs> yeah, it's been good to watch your journey, and yeah, it's interesting that we actually met in the first workshop. I helped mm. you guys out with so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, actually, let let's focus on Patty for a second, okay, because let's do it. Um, that it is yeah, interesting. Great. It is interesting because <laughs> because Patty, if you think about it, when you kicked off your financial planning career, some oh, actually, it's probably like a decade ago. Yeah, the same as, yeah. Oh, financial services. Yeah. Like, oh, that was a while ago. But yeah, yeah financial yeah. planning about the same time as you. Yeah, and um, and I said I said to Adrian at the time, I was like, mate, you just need to make every mistake in the book because he doesn't learn off anyone. But in five years, you'll make a good business business person and uh look look at you here mate five years later and you still suck i was wrong (laughs) (laughs) i'll let sean answer that one (laughs) he's he's actually improving significantly Mm. significantly in the last two years that i've seen yeah no it's been an interesting journey can't take all the credit myself but i'll take some (laughs) (laughs) yeah well i guess the combination of working with sean and and even and clayton yeah yeah, it's been uh it's been a good influence on me yeah, man. I mean, this whole this whole idea of financial services, I think it's real easy to make easy money, I think, in financial services. If you want to make easy money, you can make easy money. It's it's. I think this, the struggle starts when you try try being idealistic. Try to change things. You try, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Rock the boat, do mm, something different. Yeah. Also, you know, work out of a purpose and work out of wanting to, to get a better outcome, I think, um, which is, is where – where I guess I and you both have been on a journey. It's it's all it's very it's very easy to to just get on the gravy train and to stay there and to um, and not rock the boat. I think it's a lot safer. And, uh, but for whatever reason, I think one of the things that uh, that unites all three of us is our desire to sort of push the boundaries. So here we are. Um, yeah, with, with, uh, with fintechs and all these other things and yeah. it's crazy. Did not see Didn't it coming. Didn't plan to start a technology <laughs> business. <that's> no. <for> sure. 
Definitely not at the top of the list. Yeah, hey? but fairly happy with. Especially where it's if you, um, especially if you've um, been familiar with Sean's technical technology prowess, yeah. you would definitely not hey, pick I'm it. The product, I'm the product manager now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. He just needs an interpreter the to the technology. That's technology <laughs> understanding, but it does kind of work. So. It does. Yeah, you get that get that sort of layman sort of look on the tech. It's like. Yeah. Why are you doing that? I'm like, oh, good question. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's 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 an interesting thing. Uh, I think what you guys are trying to do. I think a lot of people have tried to solve it. Right. It's it's not exactly. Um, I mean, you, you're you're taking the inefficiencies of the industry and trying to make it more efficient. Um, and uh, you know, like. Uh, how, how many how many things can you improve there? That's that's really the question. I mean, there's an infinite amount mm. of things that need to be improved upon. I think one of the, the things that I like to imagine is if financial advice had a maximum of, say, $500, like how how could you provide advice? Mm. You know, um, if you see a lot of a lot of uh, things getting handed down by. But, uh, you know, the, the initial report from the Royal Commission, it's, it's mm. they, you know, a lot of these are the sending, there's messages getting sent and whether they get, um, you know, whether they get accepted or not is one thing or another, but a potential message or worst case scenario is that, you know, they almost want to get rid of financial planners or, or squeeze them to the point where they're forced to leave. And so I like to imagine, you know, what happens if, you know, and so I, I, Sean, I'd like to ask you that question. Um, how would you provide advice for five hundred dollars? Personally, oh, tough question. Mm. Very tough. It'd be difficult to do in the current compliance regime, that's for sure. Why? It's like I got to go talk to my tech team. Yeah. <laughs> Can you just sort that out in the back end, Adrian? <laughs> Adrian, just automate we'll... that for me. <laughs> very, very scoped <laughs> advice. <laughs> no, you okay. got to be really good at scoping stuff out. That's what. <laughs> Yeah, look, I think it's in the current retail market today with the compliance requirements, you just, you can't do that commercially. Why? Because you can't tick the boxes and jump the hurdles that you need to do to, to deliver quality advice in a compliant manner, um, even in a scoped way. Like really, how, how, how cheap could you do it if you were scoping it right down? Okay, Matt, my plan can give you a financial plan for free though. Yeah, that's not a human but what happens if you're just a human that uses Map My Plan? Well, any time a human gets involved, there's double standards about what they have to do. That's a good point. They've got file notes. They've got a computer mm. doesn't have to write file notes. That's a fucking huge element. Doesn't that's that's five hundred bucks going just on a file note. <laughs> <laughs> maybe on your file note. <laughs> no, nah, not on my file notes. The system's file notes, maybe. <laughs> and look, the system. <laughs> that's why we need the system because some people mm. their file notes are worth about five bucks of time. Audio. So, <laughs> what about just an audio? The systems will get better, but you know, they're still. There's a long way to go. Okay, let, let's theorize. Let's, you know, let's say audio file notes are fine. They automatically, you know, something that we use a lot of is Marco Polo, which is mm. a super highly efficient piece of software where it's... Um, Snapchat for old people. Yeah, Snapchat for old is, is the best way to articulate it. <laughs> because, I, we, because, you know, as, as I'm sure you probably know, Sean, with us XY guys, we don't get together that often. And so we do a lot of digital meetings and I tried to get everyone on Snapchat so that we could Snapchat just each other. And the boys were like, no, that's not happening. And so when this came out, it was hugely valuable. But what, why isn't there a software or a piece of software that you, you press start, talk into it, press stop, and then send it and attach it to the file note on your CRM? What's going on? Well, we like, had oh, the same conversation today. Yeah, there's With a couple the of audio elements. What's well, yeah, it's a, what what organizes that conversation? What do you mean? So I, I know a lot of advisors are really good at actually. Some of them have like a script that they do after the, their meeting um, when they take their notes, and bang, and they punctuate it in a way that makes makes it organized. Mm -hmm. But a lot of a lot of people aren't capable. Me for one, I would be horrible at actually. Oh, like yeah. I, could, I just can't do it. You'd be a rambling mess. Exactly, you end up with this. Fucking what? file this output that actually doesn't match the advice. It doesn't match or the, the needs. It doesn't match the needs. You probably it doesn't even. It doesn't tick compliance. It's just a useless. <laughs> you, you probably start audio ordering note. coffee. Yeah. <laughs> Was this how I order coffee? Yeah. <laughs> we're like, what oh, am I doing again? Are we on the pub. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> 
So anyway, so it works for some people, really yeah. good for some people, but like it's not There's no even bouncing for, ball. Well, there's no bounce, you can, and you can bounce through the ball, but even going through that process, is that... That's oh, okay, I'm going to call that out. Why couldn't you just have a record, you know, hit start and it asks you the question on the screen and then you press the, and, and then you press the button and then it goes, here's the next question. You answer that, answer, 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 stop, send. Well, that's what some people do and you can, but all, at the same time, that's almost a duplication of things as well. Okay. So if you're doing it at the same time in the meeting... Right, so if you're just recording a meeting and adding that as a file note. If, it, if you can organise a meeting to be a single capture, whether it's digitally in terms of written or like um, capturing it, like buttons um, of data that you're just selecting, making choices within a meeting with a client, combined potentially with, with audio at mm. the same time, mm. that's when you're going to hit. If you take, a, if yeah. you've got an, one hour and one hour completes what needs to be done with an advisor, it goes off to this mythical um, magic machine that just automatically does the advice. Mm -hmm. The advice pops out. Mm -hmm. Or even you press a button just five minutes towards the end of the meeting going, bing, yep. which is quite possible coming into the future. Well, what, why hasn't that happened yet? I've heard, I've heard, you know, so many people talk about it over the years that- Products. Products are right. They fuck up the process. Right, right. Because if you have you had, you allowed to do that? <laughs> oh, we yeah. said we weren't going to swear anymore, but maybe maybe yeah, we've we'll changed it, it that. I'm a guest now, or am uh, I interviewing? No, I you're, you're you're definitely not a guest. But <laughs> we, we let the occasional f bomb go. <laughs> I just felt really strongly. We've about stopped that. drinking beers. We're on the waters. That's that's a huge. That's that's like you know that's next level. Is that that's it's just the correlation with Ben being here or not being here really. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <Great>. <laughs> but the um. But why is, yeah, the product and, and the data. So if you can assume you have the data when a client, so cl you get a full data set before the client comes to see you, mm -hmm. then you have um, a full scoping slash discovery meeting with the client um, and get all their preferences around what they'd be prepared to change in their life. Mm -hmm. And you've got all the data points that we go into advice and you didn't have to deal with product then, or if you had all the product information yeah, at the yeah, start yeah, 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 and, yeah. It, and the information you were checking it against or yep. that the system reference was accurate and... So basically just if you can scope product out of a piece of advice, you could punch it out and then... Makes it a lot easier. Right. And well, that's the then, Matt My Plan setup. So yeah, they're not working yeah, with yeah, product. That's correct. why it's a bit easier to sort of... Right. Well, why don't we have something like this where more people will have access to financial plans that have no product attached to them and then for the people that want their product attached to them to go back to the say the same advisor and then you just pay more from there be well there's there's definitely a lot to do That's but a lead gen right but the thing, surely but the thing is one of the biggest thing is most people want you to execute and if you're executing and touching yeah. the implementation of their right. advice right it's you're not you're you're associated with that product. So yeah, yeah, yep, yep, yep. No, no, I, I'm not saying don't get it done, but why aren't? No, more I mean, but like, I don't think I don't think you could really perceive that as if you're making a recommendation and then the client says, "Oh, yep, go use that product." Yep. A lot of the compliance frameworks aren't necessarily tied to that, and actually, the way like ASIC or whatever looks at an advisor going, "Well, you let that happen, you're responsible." What do you mean? Well. So, so you give advice strategically, mm -hmm. um, and it says this allocation, this is these contributions, all the stuff that's got say got nothing referenced in the product, and then, and then the client goes, oh well, actually, yep, I've just picked the product. Um, can you go and implement that? The fact that you're letting that happen is no, no. I'm not suggesting that. I'm saying everyone gets this low cost advice, which is a financial plan. Mm -hmm. And then if they want additional financial advice, they come back for product recommendations. Right. So you're not it's actually- a offer. Yes. Yeah, so you're not, okay. actually, you're not yep. taking on their suggestions. You're, yep. It's recommendations, but that costs more. And then you're paying maybe extra for execution or implementation. Or factoring in their existing product suite yeah, as part of yep, the- Because yep. that's, that's where a lot of the cost comes mm, into play. Yeah, is, co is comparison. Comparing right? products yeah. that aren't consistent. And then comparing ones that you're not going to end up choosing in, in anyway. Which always is the weirdest thing to me. Well, it I've depends. considered these ten other options. Is that when you've got a single option APL, Clay? <laughs> <laughs> the answer is <laughs> always <laughs> X Y Z. <laughs> yeah, imagine that. Why? Why? why no deal of. Oh, I don't think you need to imagine much. You just need to go to a lot of the institutions, actually. Oh, <laughs> Patty, fighting words. <laughs>
<laughs> so, Sean, oh, anyway, you're the guest for today. <laughs> <laughs> but I love that concept, Clay. What about a tiered option? And like yeah. some people who have, are playing with that around the cash flow space. They are. That's mm. how they're sort of, mm. it's like tangible but out of the, because when you first started doing cash flow, one mm. of the big benefits is you could do, I guess, the strategy and because um, simple deposit products weren't factored into yeah financial plans yeah you yeah. didn't get burdened with all that costly sort of yeah. process that goes around it yeah it was an advice letter seven pages great right. fantastic I'll never forget delivering cash flow advice for the first time I, it's not even something I set out to do I had a client come in and he was my age and we were like thirty and he goes mate thanks heaps for this super insurance advice really appreciate it what can you do for me today. I remember just going, oh, no, <laughs> I can't answer nothing. <laughs> so I literally had to go and replicate the banking system that I had built for myself as a 22-year-old, you know, university student and then figure out a way to use products in order to provide it for him. And I'll never forget that was such a crazy, crazy time. Didn't know anyone else was doing it at the time. Turns out a couple of people were. <laughs> well, it was one of those situations where, oh, good question. Yeah. Let me come back to you. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> I wasn't taught how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but you tapped out of advice, Sean, a while ago. Yeah, so I started my advice career at Dixon with mm. you. Um, spent about three years there, focused mainly on insurance, and then after a short stint in the Sydney office, uh, jumped day. ship. <laughs> uh, yeah, is that when you met Clay? You're like, I'm out of here. Wow, this place is really this going is downhill. Going backwards. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, and so, you know, spent then a period of time uh, at BT and in charter as a partnership manager, sort of what was BT like? Side. Um, it was an interesting business. I mean, they've played in that space for a long time. They've got a lot of legacy history. Um, were you in the licensing area? Yeah, I was in Securitor, um, and they were sort of consolidating a few things. Magnitude was taking off. It was, yeah, it was an interesting business for sure. Um, I've been dealing a little bit uh, with licensees recently, do, doing doing some work with um, advisor ratings, shout out advisor ratings. Um, <laughs> and these guys are, are putting together some services and offerings for, for licensees. And uh, super interesting being going through all the, the licensees, um, hundreds of them, right? And all of the big ones, basically all of the big ones are aligned to a product. You've got um, Synchron, and it used to be Dover, mm. but now Dover's gone. So Out of the sizable. Yeah. Yeah. There's uh, not many over 100 plus. I that... was blown away by um, how, how I mean, how overwhelmingly um, products mm. are tied to advice channels. Yeah. Blown away. Pardon. Partly from where all the profit has been for a long period of time, but also acquisition from those guys over time, yeah, just yeah. buying up and integrating for sure. Yeah, you know, <coughs> sort, of, sort of go down the line and see some of the smaller ones, and they're still owned by these. It's going to be interesting. What do you think is going to happen, man? Oh, it's a tough question. Um, if they do decide to make changes and sort of start to push away that vertical alignment, it's going to it's going to have to happen over time, and mm. it's going to there's going to be a lot of friction as that process takes place. So I don't want to speculate, but um, if they do make that call, it's going to take time and it's not going to be easy for, for anybody involved in those businesses, I would think. One of the conversations that's uh, doing the rounds at the moment is whether to get rid of grandfathered commissions, which mm. I, I think is a little, I mean, I, th I feel like that, that topic was settled, you know, back at FOFA, the, 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 the options on both sides, you know, get rid of all of them or just remove the accrued default amounts, the amounts that, you know, they'd never had an advisor attached to it and they'd never made a decision. They were clearly mm. dormant. Um, sure, they're gone. But then about 80% of the industry fell into this um, grandfathering arrangement. Mm. And now that that's getting re-looked at again, um, I th I think if, if, if the change happens there, it, it's going to be... Mayhem, it's surely. It's huge. Surely. My, Pandemonium. My understanding is it's that- It's already it, causing, yeah, the prospect of change is yeah, causing a lot of- my, my understanding is it was deemed to be unconstitutional at that point in time, and that's now being reviewed again. And that's to due to the that's contract, the right? Yeah. Yeah, which which I've agreement. always uh, I've always said that subject aside, there is a contractual obligation. Totally. And if the government is coming in to change the conditions of that contract, who gets left with the bill? And I would 
obviously like to see that the advisors are not left with that bill. But yeah. uh, like, why, why, why punish the uh, the advisor worth maybe a million dollars when there is uh, a, a, a multi billion dollar product company that walks away scot free? That yeah. that I that I would have a big problem. Well, I don't think anyone's walking away scot free <laughs> out of this whole process. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Relative and I don't know, there's a lot of David and Goliath activity yeah. going on. I think. And there's one side of the argument that's quite clear in terms of the intent and what they're trying yes. to do. But yes. The other side of the argument, and I'm, I'm not an expert in it, but there's a number of issues. So there's oh, a constitutional yeah. one. Yeah. Um, there's the makeup of a lot of those old products. You can't just turn off the commission and yeah. have any impact to client whatsoever. Because yeah, this is not the whole of life in, yeah, stuff, they're not right? structured yeah. in the way that they mm. are today. Um, there's CGT implications for moving clients and yeah, all sorts of issues popping out. Think of that. And so um, how do you, you gotta yeah, how do remove you? CGT? <laughs> we, well, since we're changing the constitution, <laughs> ripping up contracts, let's let's have a few like special clauses. Special just sort of, clauses. Yeah. Imagine so, that. Imagine that. <laughs> yeah, and everyone's a lot of people have got a strong position one way or the other. Um, I, I actually, really I think you've put forward in, in in that environment. Yeah, if if we could figure out because I think everyone agrees to the concept of no grandfather commissions. Like it's it, it it's a very basic question. Like, do you think people should pay for nothing? You just you know, it's mm. all. Obviously, you say no, right? There's not really a counter argument to it. But if you look at the complexities, I think there are reasons why it does get difficult. So let's try and figure out a way to achieve both. I mm. think I think there definitely is. If you gave it a four to five year time frame and mm. say, these are the core issues that are they're creating the problems, this is how we're going to solve them within this window, I think we could mm. actually get it done. Mm. Um, and achieve a good outcome for everyone, but it, but, but to, just to simply say on a, it, it's switched off. Mm. Yeah, uh, that's yeah. like fifty percent of the industry is going to die overnight. Yeah, it's a big impact. And when you yeah. think of all the other changes that are happening over the next period of time, right, with Fazio coming through, yeah. everything else that's happening with that, and potentially, and again, who knows what the likelihood is, but potentially decoupling of the vertical integration. Yeah, those two things are just. Unbelievable Massive. impact. Yeah. Well, it's the only reason, like if you go think, look at the change that's occurred over the last few years, it's the only reason that you haven't had more decimation of the industry than has happened because you had that buffer of all these costs coming into a business that they, that, that was cross-subsidizing like, shit, I'm, shit, I can't charge that anymore. I've got to put my prices up or like the gradual realisation that you're not covering your costs to deliver initial advice, mm. um, some of the ongoing services, depending on what people are doing, that that was actually mm. giving a buffer as that was going on. You would have had a bigger attrition in the industry of advisors yeah. already like without that buffer because of all the change. So at least you've sort of had that change washed through in terms mm. of people adopting the higher cost structure, yeah. adopting more fee-for-service. Yeah higher fees, which isn't great for the consumer, but it's yeah. just got to be done. At least the business models have stayed intact. Yes. Um, or sort of become more sustainable. And then... But, but even some of the bigger businesses are struggling with margins, right? Like not everybody. There's some totally. that are killing it, but I think it's something like two thirds of the industry are one or two advisor businesses in terms of advisor head. Mm. It's massive. And so what happens to all those little guys in a world with all this change and cost pressure um, and you pull that rug out? if that's something that they'd, you know, that's the norm to their business. So yeah. it's, that's a real challenge. And again, to the purest point, yes, no one wants to charge people for something that they're not getting, but it really isn't that simple. And um, it's going to be really interesting to see how this plays out for sure. Yeah, there's a huge opportunity for, for the people that, uh, you know, there, there are companies, that, advice businesses out there that don't take a, a, a scrap of commission, right? Whether from invest, you know, uh, grandfathered investments and super, or even new insurance policies, and 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 they're going to be absolutely fine with, with whatever happens. They're typically uh, rather expensive pieces of advice, though. Mm. So, um, so while I have a lot of uh, appreciation for those business models, and I'm super stoked that they exist, and it's great to watch them, you know, uh, as sort of you know the epitome of what advice could be with the coaching and everything else around the financial <coughs> planning and the behavioural change and and support and and giving you know a lot of advice beyond what is monetary. Um, however, it's super not affordable for everyone. So you, you've got a very small subset of the population that can afford to do it. So 
Um, I think there's, as we've just spoken about earlier today, I think there's a huge opportunity um, for new style of advice uh, to come out for the masses. Um, and I can't wait to see who ends up doing it. Hey, you're painting a rosy picture there, Clay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, talk to us a little bit around the thinking of uh, Advice Revolution because mm. if we go back, you know, two years ago, the three of us were sitting around and, you know, I had this idea of I wanted to do something. You guys had an idea of what – actually, it was more you had an idea that you wanted to do something and then you're like, oh, Patty might be able to help Patty me. likes doing stuff. Patty likes doing stuff. <laughs> He's great at starting businesses. I was able to stuff. Yeah. And then what, what you didn't realise is Patty also likes to turn his business into what he wants. And yeah. so so we've got hey, this. We've it's got, just <laughs> gravity. Oh, you can Because, <laughs> you know, if you would think back to the business plan that we sat down to speak about all those yeah. years ago that uh, you did through your master's on, mm. and then Patty walks in, he's like, actually, let's do this <laughs> instead. Hey, then, I ran with that. Ever, yeah. ever so, Ever so, ever so slyly over the over the years, it's gradually you know gone from this over to here. Hey, we're just getting closer to the market's pain points. That's all, Clay. That's <laughs> all that's happened. But I don't know. It only makes sense, I guess, if you Sean can tell a bit of a narrative around, like I guess what's occurred. Like, yeah, it's been I a think, bit of a journey. I think you got to go right back. And so for me, you know, coming out of the Dixon environment, coming from a manufacturing background, personally. Coming into the Dixon environment, which is a large scale machine that's run, you know, pretty efficiently, as you mm. know. Um, and then coming into the licensee world where you've got businesses of all scale and all levels of sophistication and all levels of efficiency it was just mind blowing to see and that contrast of how some of these small businesses were operating. And and when I'm when I look at a service business, I look at it with that kind of manufacturing process mindset and I was just shocked at, at what I was seeing. Um, and so, you know, over time I sort of evolved my own view of how I would go about building an advice business, what that model would look like and and where I landed was um, organic referrals, so a JV model with partners and we decided the accounting industry um, to, to get organic growth rather than doing the book buyer concept and ending up with this messy mismatch of clients and offers and technology. Mm. Um, centralise the back end so that you could deliver a really efficient, scaled performance on the back um, and, you know, and operate that across multiple sites was the concept. And so, you know, there's clearly there's some complexity in that, but there's also some simplicity in, in the way that it runs because you really, you need to... If, if you've got clients coming in and you've got a machine in the back end, then it's very easy to sit advisors in there to do the job that they need to do, as you would have experienced in the Dixon mm. environment, right? Because you only have to focus on that one element. Yeah, it's very specific. <clears throat> so we set out to do that um, and spent, you know, probably 12 months, pretty much all of last year with that concept and design and time in the accounting world. and Made plenty of new um, friends. Yeah. We met all the cool people in the accounting industry. And that only took is. us a year. Yeah. Really? <laughs> How is the guy? <laughs> <laughs> Mostly girls. <laughs> but, yeah. Well, then we, if you throw the bookkeepers in, geez, yeah. it's a, like it, it's like the inverse <clears throat> of like financial advice proportion of male to female, yeah. like yeah, the bookkeeping really? industry. Yeah, yeah. industry. Yeah, right. So, yeah, so we went down that journey and, um, and look, we got very close to, to executing on that and um, we were looking at partnering with Charter. Um, and looking at leveraging some of the startup benefits that were available through the institutions. And with the Royal Commission hitting and, and some delays that we'd faced at that time, all of all of those things got pulled away. And so the funding to deliver on the sort of scale of business that we had in mind was was no, no longer there, mm. um, which was hard to take amongst the disruption that was going on broadly. So... We licked our wounds a little bit and um, at the same time, and to your kind of joke earlier, um, the, the technology that I'd sort of asked Adrian to, to come and was this something you want to get involved in um, was to solve some problems with technology that, that hadn't really been solved yet. Yeah. Um, and that, so both that was bringing together technology to enable the business model but also to s solve the problem of sitting advisors in different sites with a completely isolated back-end team and make sure that they could nail the delivery without all the errors and rework and pain that even some of the best scaled advice businesses still struggle with today. Um, What's that? What do you think? What do you think um, advice businesses struggle with the most? Uh, regardless of the scale, 
but it's it's clearest to be seen, I think, in a bigger business is that you have information coming from an advisor. So when you have multiple roles, you've got an advisor, you've got research, you've got power planner, you've got an admin or implementation team. Um, the advisor is great with the client and the advisor is trying to focus on the client, make sure they have a good time, making sure they're building the rapport. Um, but it's that transition of the information to the team to do their job is where things break down. So it's written on the back of a coaster and they throw right. it through to the team and the team's got to make stuff up or they've yep. got to make assumptions or they've got to go back to the advisor or somebody's got to go yes. back to the client. Yes. And no one thinks about the inefficiency of all of that process. Yep. Um, and if you're trying to do that, again, across multiple sites with a team that isn't even in the same office as the advisor, then that problem gets amplified. Um, small businesses face that problem. Single advisors doing the whole job face that problem because if they don't catch it up front, they're the ones left trying to fill the gaps because they haven't asked yeah. or haven't got all the data that was relevant. Um, so, yeah, and, you know, Adrian had a really clear vision that was clear in his mind, but he probably couldn't articulate it uh, clearly to me at that time even, but I could see that. I don't believe a word of it. <clears throat> <laughs> Paddy being unable to clearly <laughs> articulate himself. You're telling me I wasn't concise yeah. about something. <laughs> but, but, but to be, you know, full credit to him, it, it was clear in his mind that, that this was possible and, and he was coming at things from the purest advisor client experience. How do I, how do I stay focused on the client, get everything I need to do, need so that I'm not you know, anxious that I'm not going to deliver on my audit requirements or I'm going to have to go back to the client and look like a fool or whatever it might be. And so, um, yeah, so as, as that technology started to really take life, um, we, and through engagement with a lot of advisors in the industry that, you know, Adrian and I were bringing in to sort of give input to, to what we're building, we realized that we actually, we had a product there, a digital product. And um, yeah, there was no intention to actually design a product. Correct. It was purely about how do you like solve this problem, solve the problem in the business that you were looking to create for yourself. Correct. And so we had, um, startup packages that were going to be the petrol into the engine. And, mm. and the way I kind of think about it, this is sort of the, the turbocharger that was going to really get the performance out of the business. And, um, then it was literally three months ago, probably that we made the clear decision that let's actually productize this thing. What do we need to change to give flex and accessibility to anybody to have this product and to pick it up um, and easily integrate it into their existing processes or systems, um, which coincidentally turned out to be pretty easy. Um, and yeah, now we're probably looking at quarter one as a product launch. It's, it's quite funny actually being as close as I am to you guys, but also just on the, on the outside of not knowing the day to day. Uh, it, it's it's been hilarious over the years, listening to what it is that you guys are doing, mm. and then at some points I think I understand, and I, I reiterate back to you what it is. You're like, no, Clayton, that is not it. You're dumb, and I'm like, well, that I'm, notwithstanding that possibility, <laughs> what you're talking about is very hard to understand. However, what I will say is now it's not that. Now, mm. now I get it. Now it's essentially uh, it's we started biting less. Like trying to chew more than yeah more than yeah because I mean there were so many different iterations of it over time and um, but what what's what's actually really uh, nice about it is it's the business that Patty started <laughs> like about five years ago this uh, back office business um, that he that you know he was very dedicated to to getting off the <laughs> ground <laughs> and now he's just he's uh, roped you in digitized mm. it and now he's like ta da I finally did it. <laughs> Doing it, doing yeah, it. Doing it. <laughs> well, I, I guess, yeah. It just, it's, I, I love, I love how focused you have been on getting this done, and you're like, come hell, you know, or high it's water. It's just pure frustration sitting there going, "This is fucked." Like, why does it have to work like this? Mm. <laughs> like, pretty much, and that's like everything's. <laughs> it's like, what would I, what would I loved as 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 advising mm. like to have? Mm. What would have made my experience like more enjoyable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's pretty much answering those and, questions. And, you know, and the experience of going through this, I literally remember sitting down at the pad with a blank piece of paper and going, all right, so what is this thing? <laughs> and let's, <laughs> and watching his mind kind of click over. But, um, you know, what's been really interesting and, and I think the reason why he's been able to achieve what he's, he's achieved in, in the build is 
you know, he's clearly got a, for anyone who's done HBDI, he's got a very strong yellow big picture mm. brain. Um, but it's countered by um, a very strong green detail brain. Yeah, it's the brain. weirdest and combo. It really is. And it's not always the most Confusing. efficient, effective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, really constantly being, <laughs> it's constantly <laughs> being torn apart. I think this is why he just adds alcohol most of the time <laughs> and things make more sense. It sort of brings me in between but, somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> but it's it's a really interesting space in, in particularly, I, I, I would think, in any technology design because you, you, you have a vision, you're seeing where things are going, you focus... You know, you focus on the people mm. and how the experience is going to land, but then the ability to go into detail that my eyes literally glaze over yes. in terms of the technology decisions and the detail that yeah. um, that's required. And, and, and another learning for me on the technology space is I just thought that when you wanted to solve something, you just had to find someone who could tell you the answer mm. for that thing. Mm. But... Um, People have different views on how you could solve that problem. Really? And so without having that polarisation, how would you be able to be strong enough to make the call on which option to take? And I think that's that's been really powerful. Crazy thing I learned about very <clears> recently <throat> is tech guys, about 50, they've, they've done a few studies on this. Hey, I'll, I'll preface it by talking about another study. Um, something like 50% of people think they're in the top 10% of drivers. You've, you've heard that sort of statistics. So 50% of uh, tech guys think they're in the top 5%. So, yeah. <laughs> it's more amplified. Mm, they're an arrogant bunch, are yeah, they? Yeah. And so <laughs> whenever you talk to a tech guy, he's always like, mate, I've got the bloody solution and uh, this is exactly how it needs to get done. And they're always so self, self-confident and self-assured mm. uh, that, that – I is get it? sold. I'm, I'm like, well, this guy knows what's going on. Well, they're I clearly smart. don't. They are very smart, but they're but it's very. Not, it's a different type of. It's a weird sort of thing where mm. a lot of tech guys think that, and they all look down on, you know, business guys, right? Like, a, they, they all, they all have this sort of uh, cloaked disdain for what it is that we're trying <laughs> to achieve, mm. and they're very convinced that they have. Make up your mind. Stop better, changing. Mm, you- <laughs> a better, a better, a better answer. But the facts mm. are like. The end of the day, we need to work together with these tech guys. Mm. The tech guys and, and 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 product design people need to work together. So, mm. thank you know. Eventually, we've got to figure it out. It's like you know, I th- I think there's there's less in common I have with a tech guy, the, the concept of men of Mars and women are from Venus, right? That it's probably like tech guys are from Venus and you know business guys are from Mars kind of thing. It's it's and that. from Saturn. <laughs> Yeah, but but you know along that journey, I just I just can't imagine how we would have been able to make those calls effectively without that kind of polarization mm. that, that he's been able to bring to the table. Well, it's a very you nice up. thing to say about Adrian and Patty. Oh, I've got plenty of right bad here. things I can say about him. I'm telling <laughs> you that. Right. Let's stick with that. Stick with that. Uh, um, so, yeah, yeah and, and you're focusing now full time on this, right? Except for your your work that you're doing in X Y. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's um, decided to get serious about it, really. It's sort of like uh, I guess one of the biggest things about like if we talk about this journey that we've gone and we started, like we we start with me doing quite a few different things and then getting together with Sean and Sean, Sean really likes ideas as well. Mm. Like the poor guy, he, he loves an idea. <laughs> so I'm there sprinkling all these ideas on him and he's like, yeah, yeah, I like that one. Not so much that one, that one. Yeah, but the problem is you load them, him up. them down. You load him up with a few ideas and there's enough there that stick that I'm like, oh, shit, what have I done? What have I done? <laughs> like, it's like, is this my fault or has he just been like, yeah. I don't know, or is this actually a good idea? <laughs> so we, we were doing a lot of things at the same time in our journey along yeah. like this last couple of years. Uh, this, yeah, this last couple of years essentially. And I guess – I've refined what I'm doing, like my my personal scope's been refined and then also what we're focusing on has been refined. It's just constantly like the, the journey to that destination has been, I guess, really, it's just been a discovery really of like what's more important, what's more important, what's more important because you then you, you, you take on a few different things and you get a bit overwhelmed and you're like, okay, shit, we can only do so much, chunk it down. And we did that like three or four times over this mm. last period of time. It would have helped maybe if we did it a bit quicker sometimes. Um, yeah, always the case. Yeah, yeah. But mm. like being able to go, the reason why we're at the front of 
the front of the engagement with the advisor and the client is that the, the advisor is the most expensive um, component of the advice. I, I got a difficult question to ask mm. you guys, right? Obviously, you know, you're a startup and you've got a million things to solve and, and X, Y is no different to that, right? Mm. Um, so I have, I have the feeling that you can't fit people into, you know, confined boxes, that everyone is it ha- has a situation that can't just be tick boxed. Now, mm. now, now, you guys ha- are developing a process that requires things to be ticked boxed. So, what do you think about that conundrum? Well, you answer I'd it because I'll be a bit yeah, more. Um. Yeah, I'd, <laughs> I'd say that um, those boxes need to be ticked regardless. And so, um, the the tool or, the, or the, the platform really just enables a human to go through that process in a flow that makes sense um, and as efficient as possible. So whether you have the platform or not, um, to deliver really good quality advice and to do it compliantly under the regime today, then you really need to do those things anyway. So regardless of, of my, you know, philosophical thought, it needs to get done. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. What's your perspective on that? Well, I think there's definitely a romanticism around advice. Um, and I guess it comes from a bit sort of if, you, if you're going, well, what's my value? And a lot of, I think a lot of people struggle with the concept of a computer being able to synthesize that relationship with the client. Mm. And and I think the argument is that you're not a, a computer is not re, um uh, going to synthesize that relationship with the client. You're going to synthesize it, but what you say to the computer can still be categorized in a way that um systemizes that. So to make it clear, it's like okay, well, sing in front of the client you're, you're discussing, you're teasing out that whole journey with the client, getting them to express themselves, getting them to open up about things. That's your job there. You then you then bringing you're bringing all this all this in, input into the advice process essentially by that. Now, how do you capture that input? Now, like what you're doing that interaction to get that information out of them is um, is a that that's the real sort of human magic that's going Correct. on. But what what they're giving to you can always be put into some sort of box. Sure. So there's like, I'm not happy about this or I'm happy about this. There's a range of human emotions, a range of human um, wants and needs, and they can all be categorised. So it's just about ga- if you ca- accurately capturing that from the, the individual and if you apt- a- accurately capture that and categorise it, it then digitises it. And I've got a belief that like the next step in the advice process in five years' time that's it could be a click of the fingers and everything else is done because you take so everything everyone's digitizing the the quantitative data capture so you're getting all the assets liabilities sure. yes. people's financial situation but it's how do you digitize that human element and what are those what are those components that represent um, i guess the human side of a client their values all all that sort of stuff we've used the human language to categorize all these things it's just about how do you extract that and put it into an organized sort of framework. So what price point are we talking here, boys? So this isn't a $10,000 a year client. This is, is this closer to a... We're not setting a price point. Like what, in terms what, of... What, 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 what would, about for the platform? No, no. So... Um, what type what, of client? What type of client? Uh, what, what Current what, state uh, or future state? I, I, have a, I have a pretty clear view on this. Yeah. What's the perfect I client? Would, I would say ultra high net wealth is out. Yeah. Right? That's, that was, that's what I was saying. I would think maybe really complex advice for a high net wealth client would be out. Mm-hmm. Yep. But anything down to scoped advice for a mass market client right. would be in play from there. So, so you, 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 you're, you're, I like to use the word attempting, but people always get get offended when I use the word attempting. They say, no, yeah. I'm doing. But you're ultimately, you're attempting to mcdonalds fire financial advice. Oh, Porto's. <laughs> well, well, that implies combined with Subway, but, it's quite healthy. Yeah. But that implies that that's what's going to be delivered to client, and that's really not. So that's not why. I think Are you guys that. delivering so, the SOA at the end? No. So what it is right. is it's platform that the advisor uses from the first touch point with the client. Yep. Through to the handover to the back end team. So it's the power it. planner. Yeah. So the well, research and power. So planning. it's it's filling in the gap between advisor and power planner. 
Correct. It's so it's so a power planner can get the work done quicker. How do you make a power planner love the your advisor? Like, how do you make them not sit around going, "What the fuck is and he so just written down there?" It doesn't right. impact the advice. It doesn't impact the way that the practice delivers their service or what their service is. It just optimizes the advisor. Right. So we've cut the advisor time in half from industry averages, mm-hmm. um, and we've packaged the information more information than arguably any practice would probably capture today and yeah. package that and handed it over to the team um, in a really effective um, and consistent way. Yeah, right. Quite quite the undertaking. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's spent a bit of time. It is a frustrating piece. I mean, it's probably the most frustrating piece is, is, is this piece that you're talking about. Um, yeah, it's you, like you've you, just walked out of a meeting, Clay. Great conversation. Mm. And you're like, Fuck, what's the compliance requirements again? What do I need to, ma- what do I need mm. to write down? Like, mm. Mm. So how much of it can, okay, let, let's, let's talk about it in a real world scenario. Are they doing this sort of stuff in the meeting or are they doing it before, after, it's, when? Yeah, so it's up to the advisor okay. if they want to share um the, the, the broader discovery journey with the client or not. But ultimately, whether they're doing it with the client with the tool or whether they're using the tool themselves after the meeting, that's the complete data capture that you need to be able to push that down the line. So what happens if you guys, like, get the best product imaginable, right? It just nails all the problems, right? And it's excellent. You're super stoked. And the Royal Commission comes in and changes everything. What's going to happen? doesn't affect it. That's actually ideal. Why? Well, we're not doing anything that's affected because by the Royal Commission. Because it's license agnostic. It's easy for a practice to pick up. And I'll tell you what I'd love to see come out of the Royal Commission is a one-page advice. Go back to that. That would be excellent. You know, I think a lot of this stuff that we're capturing is redundant. A lot of it's a lot of it's not necessary. A lot of it's just the tick boxes. What sort of stuff? <sighs> okay. Like let's say because uh, we're talking about being able to, to punch out advice, right? Mm-hmm. So essentially, like giving people, uh, potential clients or clients, an excellent human interaction, and then if making everything efficient that's not client focused. Um, so I mean, if someone walks in and goes, has a two hour meeting with you, and then ultimately it turns out that they need to put twenty thousand dollars aside into a into a into a bank account for the next three years. Um, that'll pay off, you know, some credit card debt and, uh, and, and push them in a position where they can save for their kids university. Let's, let's say it's actually really simple advice, but I need to sit there and collect the depreciation on the car. This is just not, not nonsensical, right? So, so why can't I, you know, I I want that's what I would love to see coming out of the Royal Commission is, is that we go back to one page advice. Because uh, there's no commission, right? I think commissions came in. Commis- commissions is why a lot of this compliance came in. But if we remove not only grandfathered advice uh, and then insurance commissions as well, sorry, grandfathered commissions and insurance commissions, then you end up in an environment where there's no commissions, right? Why should we have to create more than one page of advice? So I'm hearing, I'm hearing two things when you're talking about this. Mm. And there's two, and they're sort of being mixed together a little bit. Now, the one page advice, amazing. Fantastic. Yes. Great. Let's do it. Let's because, do it. Because all that represents is synth- you can take a shitload of data, but what the client actually wants to do, or sorry, what, you, what you're recommending should be able to be said on one page. Yes. For all of us. Yeah. The actual- Well, not Like all the implementation advice. gets more complicated, yeah. but a lot of advice- a lo- if a you lot don't have advice. to rationalize what the avi- why the advice was there- Yeah, correct. And you're just saying what needs to be done- Yeah, and a simple why and what outcomes expected? Yeah, it should be one page. That'd be awesome. Okay, so that's that's the output. Yes, but it doesn't mean the input is simple. Um, and the thing that dictates that is what the advisor is supposedly meant to be doing. What the data is being collected? No, that dictates what the data what data you collect. So, what is an advisor and what are they meant to be doing? If an advisor's there mm-hmm. and they're responsible to analyze a complete like. And this is the best interest duty environment. Yes. They are meant to look at the whole situation of a client yes. and identify risks. Yes. We are risk assessors with the current 
environment the way we're perceived. That's an interesting or the way, way compliance. To put it. So if you don't actually look under all the rocks, you ca- you can't put your hand up going, I looked under all the rocks and But that's what I mean. Scrap best interest duty. Well that's 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 the issue. It's not about it's got nothing to do with products. It's actually the issue is products are gonna that's gonna be cleared I, up by I think yeah remove okay, fair so enough. So it's it's all so about it's actually the breadth of what and, advisors are responsible for. But I think I think I think uh best interest duty again has come in because of commissions again. So if, again if you can get rid of commissions then yeah, get rid of best interest duty, get rid of a lot of stuff. Because there's nothing competing for 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 the best advice, right? Yeah. The, you you don't need to legislate uh best interest because well, only the best interest is the only outcome that's fathomable, unless you've got an absolute prick as an advisor. Like that, it's the only thing that can't account for it. Well, no, it's it's it, it it's definitely best interest is like that's that's the concept, but it's also like okay, well, it's also risk as well. Like just even if you take best interest out of it, legislative risk because no, sorry, um, uh, litigation risk mm. because if you're sitting with a client and you haven't asked those questions, arguably you, sh- you should go, well, actually you don't need best interest duty. That would actually just define what's important. But if you go to an accountant to set up a company, mm-hmm. they don't say, is opening a company the best thing for you? If I go to a lawyer and, and, and a solicitor and need them to look at my contracts because mm. I'm about to exchange on a house, they don't go, should you really be buying this house? I, I, I just I feel like we're overcomplicating because based on uh, commissions, and then yeah, once the, they're gone, we should be able the to The demands say- on the advisor are completely unreasonable. Correct. It's there's no other even even doc, doctors are probably the closest thing to covering the breadth that advisors cover, but the demands on them to expect what expecting them to know everything around like someone's medical situation within a certain um, environment, it, they've got a huge support team that supports them. There's, so they don't even get that expectation. Advisors are supposedly meant to be able to be across everything. There's no one else. I don't think anyone, like doctors are the closest, but they've got a huge support team that support them. Or maybe GPs are probably a similarity. And you know how often, it is, how hard it is for GPs to pick up on stuff. They've got to refer out to specialists all the time. So, like, yeah, I reckon there's potentially uh, they're potentially asking too much from advisors. Yeah, I I, I think it's huge. Um, something that I learned the other day is how a law firms put together. Everyone's individually licensed, but then works as a as a as a cooperative within mm. it. And then you chuck your fees into a pool, and then the partners take you know their, their amounts, and then the lower the lower uh, ranked uh, lawyers get get their amounts. Um, and it is, it can be a little bit difficult because you can upend and move and take clients and it does get a little bit, does get a little bit ferocious there. But for the, the practices that can sort of with an iron fist rule it and, and, you know, control that, that downside from happening, it's a very interesting way, uh, to see it. So I, I see similarities in the law field for, for the future advice and definitely I see, um, the similarities with with uh, with advice and medicine. I mm. think yeah, you do have the GP, but yeah, you do have the specialist. You know, mm. and uh, it's going to be interesting to see how all advisors end up working together um, in these individually licensed environments, uh, I, I, and hopefully just giving a couple of pages of advice. And that is, gentlemen, my idea of the future of advice right there. Ah, the two-page advice document. Uh, two, two, one or two pages. First said by uh, Clayton Daniel in 2018. <laughs> Not, never actually um, eventuated. Uh, <laughs> we'll see, we'll see. If we can do anything about uh, helping the, the outcomes of the Royal Commission, that would be awesome. But anyway, gents, it is a, a Friday afternoon and, um, and yeah, it's probably time uh, for a sneaky cold one potentially afterwards. Um, I know we've got another uh, interview coming up right now, but Sean, always a pleasure to have you on, man. This is the second time or third? Second time. Second I knew what time. I was coming in for. Yeah, I yep, probably yep. would have been a little bit nervous had I not uh, ridden shotgun for Vic last time. <laughs> yeah. but, um, <laughs> You know what to expect. Adrian didn't throw you under the bus too much, so that's uh, it's a no. good outcome. All he right, didn't mate. throw me under we, the bus we too much. traded <laughs> off for me to paint some of a rosy picture. Yeah, I said so easy yes. if I delivered I was wondering that. why that was so nice before. And Sean, and Sean, if people wanted to find out more about what you do. Correct. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Great question there, buddy. 
<laughs> yeah, so um, we'll have a presence at the FPA conference in the next couple of weeks. Cool. Um, you get to hear Adrian's voice doing a couple of sort of 10-minute pitches in the fintech The zone. chainsaw. Yeah, we going, And, yeah, um, <laughs> yeah and ha- you know, uh, we do uh, public demos, so you can register on the website if people want to come in. That's probably the best way to really understand the tool. Yeah. Um, they take 60 minutes, and, you know, I think everybody who's – who's been involved and, and seen what's there has been really interested. So certainly would suggest that'd be valuable for anybody who wants to know more. Awesome. Well, mate, thank you very much for coming in. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Cheers.